This is Regrid CEO, Jerry Paffendorf. And on this episode of Living in the Map, I speak with Robert Berry, co-founder of the Land Art Generator Initiative. Since 2009, Land Art Generator has invited artists, architects, and renewable energy experts to design beautiful, functional, site-specific renewable energy systems. We talk about the project, land use through the lens of energy, and strategies for motivating and realizing a renewable energy future. All right. Hey, Robert. Hi, Jerry. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So uh, by way of quick introduction here, I always like to give a little context of how I come across the, the guests and people that I want to talk to. And it was maybe a month or so back, I was kind of poking around wanting to catch up on the state of land art in the U.S. I'm an old art school head. That was kind of my background in the creative arts and working with land information. I was like, there's got to be cool stuff happening in the land art space. It's not like, you know, Robert Smith's Smithson spiral jetty kind of stuff that I would remember from like way back in the day. And one of the top uh, results that popped up was land art generator. And I was like, what is this? I was like, oh, this is, it's land art, but it's land art and renewable energy and land use and community engagement around design and all these things that I find absolutely fascinating. So I went down the rabbit hole um, really fell in love with the work that you and your partner, Elizabeth, are doing, and uh, really appreciate you making the time to to chat about it with us today. Yeah, Elizabeth and I are both um, long fans of the land art movement of the American Southwest, um, 60s and 70s. And uh, it's interesting in the context of climate change, um, like uh, Spiral Jetty is no longer at the shore anymore on the Great Salt Lake. and. Yeah. Uh, Double Negative by Michael Heiser recently was one of the reasons that the Battleborn Solar Project was canceled. So there's always some interesting parallels. But land art um, having a place in, in our heart um, is was very informative when we were developing the idea of the land art generator in 2008. And another really important um, technology was the solar power tower installations, which you have uh, tens of thousands of mirrors, these heliostats that follow the sun across the sky and focus its light onto a central tower collector, where that of molten salt feeds uh, steam to a turbine. And these are almost like unintentional works of land art because yeah. you can see these beams of light, they're kind of beautiful in their own industrial kind of way. And it got us thinking about, well, what if we bring artists, designers, uh, interdisciplinary teams to to think about energy landscapes and a new way that is very cognizant, intentional with regard to their relationship to human culture. So those ingredients, uh, art, energy efficiency, renewable energy, land use, you're, you're speaking my kind of language here. One of the things that I had, had read about the project, I'm kind of curious about this is, did you, did you guys get the original idea back circa 2008 when you were doing work in Dubai? Is that correct? That's right. We had just gotten married and moved to Dubai and Elizabeth was teaching at a university there. And I got a job working on Mazdar City as an architect. And so um, we were there in that crazy place, the eyes of the world in 2008, you know, the Burj Khalifa, then known as the Burj Dubai was still um, going up. Uh, Mastar City was capturing everyone's imagination in terms of the world's first zero carbon city um, announced. And the Norman Foster master plan um, was really interesting um, in, in the way that it was learning from um, vernacular architecture of the region, but also taking a very high tech approach. And uh, so it was fascinating to work on that project. We were inspired by the culture, the landscapes of the UAE and Oman. And um, there's also a rich tradition of Emirati land artists that we came to discover at a place called the Flying House uh, Art Gallery, which is, I think, no longer in operation, but uh, um, just an interesting a mix of things. And of course, you know, an inconvenient truth had come out two years before. Um, I had studied architecture in the 90s at Carnegie Mellon University and had a background in um, integrated systems design and, um, and sustainable design, always 
concerned about the footprint of buildings. And Elizabeth also um, came out of uh, her Master's of Fine Arts from CMU, although we didn't know each other when we were both at the university, only met uh, a few years later. But um, but also she was working um, in, in the context of arts relationship to environment. So we, we really not only married our souls, but also our passions. And so when we arrived in Dubai and we're thinking about all these things and seeing the, the NIMBY pushback, which was already reeling uh, its ugly head at the time, um, we were thinking about, well, how can we celebrate renewable energy as something super sexy and awesome and, you know, start to create a counter narrative to the doom and gloom of, um, of Al Gore's lectures, which, you know, the science communications is important and it's important to, to make sure that the public is aware of the loss of habitat and the impact on, on biodiversity and rising sea levels and mass droughts and, and, and all of the stuff that we know very well. Um, but at, at the same time, if you dwell only on the negative stuff, then you create a sense of futureless in the mind of the public and a lack of imagination and a lack of collective will to action. We really thought then and still think today that um, a healthy mix of, of reality and science, but also um, understanding also another thing that was starting at the time was the solutions project. So we were really keyed into that. We were seeing that there, the technology already existed even in 2008, and it's only gotten better now with the price of solar and wind just plummeting since then, that we have all the tools we need to, to transition our energy systems. Um, it's just a matter of political will and how do you create political will? We think that you do that through inspiring people and planting a seed of desire. Certainly, um, Madison Avenue advertisers, they never sell us things um, by invoking our feelings of shame and fear. And they do that through desire. So if we want people to fight for a clean energy future and a post-carbon world, then we need to show them how awesome it's going to be once we get there. I, 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 lo I love that. There's so many things you said that I, I want. There's avenues I want to go down. One, one thing that stands out to me, and this is just a confession about somebody who I think about land use all the time, work with a lot of renewable energy companies. I encounter a project like yours and it makes a stand out and start release that like, I don't know a lot about how these systems work. They're usually pretty far away and pretty abstract. There's not a lot to get excited about when it comes to the specifics of these systems, other than, Hey, it's going to be cleaner, greener, ultimately more cheap, better for us. But some of the things I've heard you talk about in, in your work is like also the history of like how close people used to live to energy systems in our cities before we had the um, capability to like transfer the energy over great distances and how they used to be designed differently. And I, I also love that some of your work kind of harkens back to some of this history of maybe bringing these things back into the eyesight and the um, the, the foot traffic area of communities. So you can actually see and embrace and start to learn more about these energy systems, because speaking personally, it's like a blankness in my brain. You're not allowed to typically go up to any kind of energy production facility and you don't have a relationship with it and you can't ask sort of organic questions about it. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So the hot topic, uh, these days is, uh, interconnected DC microgrids and, um, you know, distributed, um, energy generation, but these are not new. The very beginning of electrification was DC microgrids in downtown Manhattan and distributed energy generation, um, at, in nodes as they came, came to be, uh, cooperatives. And, um, all of this is to say that it really was a requirement because we couldn't raise the voltage high enough to transmit efficiently over long distances. So every neighborhood had a gas or coal fired power plant in it um, back at the turn of the last century. And so if you ask somebody on the street, where does your electricity come from? They point to the power plant. Now, 
not an ideal situation because they were very polluting of the atmosphere. We've all seen the photos. Folks had to bring an extra shirt to work every morning as they uh, to change once they got there because they had to commute through air of soot. Um, and so as soon as we were able to raise the voltage high enough and export that production to remote areas, we did that. We And now those power plants still exist, but they're museums of energy uh, or the Tate Modern in London is a great example. Um, Cause they're, and, and also uh, nearby Battersea station. Um, and cause they're beautiful works of architecture because they were designed to fit into the fabric of the, the community and the architectural, the, the normative aesthetic of the time. And um, so they're, they're beautiful works of art in their own right. But when they moved out of the city, they became pure utility, something that we drive quickly by and no one really has an understanding of where their electricity comes from behind that past the switch on the wall, which is another hurdle in the energy transition because as you're building coalitions for change, um, if people don't really understand that their energy is dirty once they turn the light on, um, you know, clean electricity and coal fire electricity create the same light in your 40 watt bulb. So we need to connect people culturally back to the energy systems that, that we rely on. And so by bringing um, exemplary works of, of clean energy generation infrastructure into our cities and designing them as works of public art, we can get people really excited about knowing where their energy comes from and uh, excited to, to, to help support um, more of that um, within urban areas or expert urban areas and um, and as we do so, we can ease the burden on energy transmission um, infrastructure, which is always difficult. And it'll be more efficient, um, less losses, um, more resilient, less um, single places for um, for things to go wrong and cut off entire grids. Um, so uh, the energy grid of the future, hopefully, will be quite distributed. Um, a lot of the generation will happen near to where people live and work again. So we're going back to that model. Um, and not because we can't transmit electricity across long distances. Now with high voltage DC, we can go thousands of miles with minimal losses, which is a wonderful part of the solution to a clean energy future as well. When you can send um, copious amounts of wind energy from the Midwest uh, up to the Northeast and, uh, and South um, into um, like Phoenix, uh, then you can really help um, the intermittency issues with that as well. But, um, but getting back to the, the cultural um, transformation, back when we were generating electricity in our cities and electricity was this new and awesome thing, think the era of Nikola Tesla. It's interesting if you look back at some of the patents um, in terms of wind energy generation, early wind energy generation, and uh, wave energy generation experiments, they were designed with the kind of um, steampunk aesthetic of the late 19th century. So it's really cool to look back at those things. Well, I think so, so locally. So, um, yeah, I was based, our company was based out of Detroit for up 10 meters and um, March, 2020, we always had a fairly distributed team too, but my wife and I moved up to Michigan's Upper Peninsula, which is a fairly remote place. The history of um, of, of mining and, and timber and extraction for the most part, and we live in an old copper mining capital. And for a period of time when the extraction was at its peak, it was one of the wealthiest communities in Michigan and in the country at the time. This was like late 1800s, early 1900s. And we have this place, I was thinking about this, looking at land art generator. Um, it, right now it's a ruin. There's nothing there anymore, but we used to have a functional streetcar system that was many, many miles long. And there, we had one of those electric parks, which I've come to learn was kind of a phenomenon. It was like the energy for the streetcar was generated in this place. And when I look at the history of electric park, they did ballroom dancing, they did community events. There was amusement park stuff for the kids. And I kind of laughed looking at, it. I mean, now it's all just in the trash heap here. I even look at that as an example, even in a remote community like this, where it was like, there was a very different um, you know, in the cases of those parks, almost like Disney-esque, like come to this spot because I, you know, part of it, you lose this when you move forward in time is what a miracle it was to begin with. People kind of coming together to celebrate that miracle of 
of any think of the Chicago World's Fair. That's another great example. Yeah. So 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 tell me more. So about the um so so the, these are the goals of the project. This is the 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 mission that you're dedicated towards. How does the actual the programming that you run, where you have places and calls for proposals, you guys, you know, not only are you land art generator, you're beautiful illustrations of energy proposal generator. You know, if you follow you guys on, on Instagram and, and Twitter and you look at your website, there are so many um, rendered projects um, that put forward a much more, um, uh, much better aesthetics and much more interesting design and captioned energy. How do, the, how do these contests work? Do you call them contests? Like what's the, just describe to us the, the, uh, the applications and the body of work that, that you've built up over time. Yeah, um, and I just want to say that um, I think that utilitarian wind and solar uh, technology has its own kind of industrial beauty. And um, so we're not saying that it's ugly, so to speak. We're just trying to um, push the boundaries of what is possible. And uh, a lot of these technologies, especially in the realm of solar, the photovoltaics is quite versatile as a creative medium. It's not used that way very often. Um, but it, it has the potential to be used that way. And so when Elizabeth and I started the Land Art Generator Initiative in 2008 in Dubai, we were um, brainstorming actually at the um, bar above Ski Dubai. Um, <laughs> so next to um, one of the big energy demand lows of the city there. Um, and we, we, we thought about how we could establish these um, energy, landscape, energy landscapes as cultural destinations and capture the imagination of the world. We quickly arrived at the idea of a design competition um, so that we could build a network of people engaged in thinking this way. So we launched our first design competition in 2010. And between the origin of the idea in 2010, we did a lot of work, uh, exhibitions, information graphics, some of our early information graphics, including the surface area required to power the world with solar, which was one of the, um, the first things that went kind of viral for us. And it's been tweeted by Elon Musk, and it was in the International Energy Agency report. Um, I want to talk more about that because you guys also have some really great maps and just research behind this too. It's, it's multifaceted. Work. Yeah, yeah. We just wanted to, to learn, learn for ourselves um, what it would take. And so based on just some assumptions around how, how, how much energy you can generate uh, per square kilometer of area, um, given a typical solar array, we just laid it out. Um, we've since updated that graphic to show a suite of renewable energy technologies and thinking about the difference between an energy landscape where you're counting the space between the rows of solar as part of the energy landscape and the technology itself. So we're trying to really clearly communicate what the real impact of a 100% renewable energy powered global economy will look like. And the land use implications are not insignificant. Um, it's going to require some creativity and some um, rethinking about shared land uses, solar plus agriculture, agrivoltaics, solar plus um, reservoirs, flotovoltaics, solar plus um, public spaces, communivoltaic, and how can we um, make our cities more beautiful, provide co-benefits to people at the same time as we really deploy aggressively as much solar as we possibly can. Um, and so to get back to the design competition element, we we worked throughout 2009 to, to build this idea through this information graphics. We started, we wrote our first field guide to renewable energy technologies. And then we launched in January, 2010 with our first design competition for three sites in Dubai and Abu Dhabi. And it was a bit of a guerrilla thing. Like we reached out to the people who, uh, the entities who were the land owners um, and told them what we were doing and asked their permission. Um, and they uh, basically had no idea what we were talking about and said, yeah, sure, you know, knock yourselves out. Um, one of the sites happened to be adjacent to Mastar City, which was uh, strategic 
uh, location because when we went back to Mazdar with the proposals, and you can see that in the landartgenerator.org portfolio for Loggy 2010, those proposals, which were the first ideas ever to come in for this concept of yeah. utility scale energy generation designed by artists. And so they saw those and they were super excited. They decided to put us center stage at the World Future Energy Summit and they paid for an exhibit of the outcomes. They paid the prize award. They flew the winning team in um, because up until that point, we, we had no sponsorship, although we were looking for sponsorship. It was 2009 and companies, you know, it was a financial crisis. But what we did have was a lot of creatives around the world, architects who were looking for stuff to do for the same reason. Uh -huh. And so we got a lot of submissions and a lot of really high quality submissions that blew us away, really. Um, of course, we they all came in and in the very last minute. So up until the, the day before the deadline, we thought it was a complete uh -huh. failure. We had one project that had been uploaded and we were like, well, at least we got one. Uh -huh. <laughs> but we learned quickly that architects, artists, uh, landscape architects, et cetera, they don't upload their competition entry until the hour before the deadline. So we woke up the next morning in Dubai to um, nearly 200 projects. It was just like, wow. What was life so, in the world keeps it as nerve wracking as possible? Right up until uh, yeah. So. yeah. Yeah. Boy, it's stressful. <laughs> it, every every time it's stressful. Um, I've we're got, just so. Well, I've got so, you're, 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 there's so many questions my, my brain is talking to. So, so one, you, you have all these fantastic proposals and they're, they're really beautiful and interesting to, to look through. And I'm curious, like this, this fans out into like a couple of related questions in, in my head. So one is, you know, would, would love to hear some of your favorite stories of, um, you know, submissions and then things that have been realized. Um, just some of the, some of the, the stories about that too, because I have to imagine like it's a trick. The, one thing to get a great proposal another thing to like actually get it, you know, executed in a space. And I imagine that there's a variety you know, like a long tail of different kind of outcomes on that front of stuff that does get made, stuff that doesn't get made. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, like for your individual practice too, my understanding is, is you all really get in, you know, maybe get involved with some projects in partic particular places, like more than just like a jury competition, like work that you guys do as, as your own kind of like design consultant. And then just foreshadowing, like, I'm really curious, like how you've seen, um, renewable energy companies and developers, like, do you see them picking up your practices and starting to like integrate some of these ideas at a larger scale? That's too much all at once. So let's back up and just force that <laughs> here. So let, let, let's back up to sort of like, you know, fa favorite projects and like executions and things related to that. How do they come off the page and start to get built? Well, we love all of the projects that get submitted to the land or generator. So it's, um, that's a caveat. I will talk about a few projects, but they're all amazing. And so there's this network of thousands of designers around the world who are engaged in this. We're so fortunate to have um, so much support from all these creatives. And we have repeat participants who, um, some of whom have, have entered every year since 2010. So that's quite amazing. Oh. Um, so one of those is Antonio Macca. He's an architect from Italy. Um, and his was that one I mentioned when we had one project he uploaded early that year. So he's a bit of an outlier in that regard. And he and was the was longest. Good work, Antonio. We like him. <laughs> yeah, he's amazing. Um, and his first idea was called Solar Ecosystem. And it was a represented, representation of the solar system on the day that the UAE was founded, December 2nd, 1971, I believe. Okay. And so the, the planets were in a certain position in their rotation around the sun. So he captured that and he created these um, orbs in a field, um, each of which is clad with a uh, thin film solar material and is designed to be a, a graphic representation of the most salient feature of that planet. Um, so Earth has this um, etched um, graphic of the continents and it surrounds a, a palm tree to signify life. And there's this crescent solar installation uh, that's the moon around it. And um, in the center is this beautiful 
arabesque golden sphere of photovoltaic. And altogether, the project would generate uh, enough electricity to power more than 100 homes. Um, and the, the sphere in the center is really the most beautiful element of all, ties it all together. And it uses a gold tinted photovoltaic technology that's available off the shelf today. Um, you can get tinted um, polycrystalline silicon modules in really any color. Uh, there's a number of companies that provide those. And there are also um, fabricators who will take that solar cell, basically the, the sliced um, module and they will create or a sliced cell and they'll create their own custom shape modules. So it's all feasible. We haven't built it yet, although we are getting close to implementing that uh, at full scale. Uh, we can't wait for the day when we can celebrate the opening of the solar sun with Antonio. Um, since then, he's entered um, every year, basically. Um, in 2020, for the project at Fly Ranch, which was a partnership with Burning Man Project in Nevada, he entered with this beautiful um, um, installation, which uses uh, an off-the-shelf technology again by this lighting company called HEI. They create these curved um, monocrystalline silicon modules in this lovely glass that could be used as kind of Legos to create sculptural pieces. So he's always looking deep into the field guide that we produce, pulling out an interesting ready technology and, and rethinking its application in, in a really conceptual way. Um, another artist that has entered many of the land art generator competitions is Santiago Muras Cortes. He's an architect out of Argentina and his 2014 submissions, the solar hourglass was the first place that year. And it is an hourglass shape to remind us all that there's still time to avert the worst effects of climate change if we can act together swiftly. So it's a positive, inspiring message about um, the beauty of our post-carbon future, exactly, you know, what we're trying to accomplish with the land art generator. It's also a concentrated solar power thermal power plant, which would run about a thousand homes equivalent in its electricity production. And it basically is based on that solar power tower technology. So um, in the top fold of the hourglass, you have these heliostats that track the light of the sun as it moves across the sky. And they focus that onto a parabolic shaped mirror in the center of that field that creates a vertical beam of light that then passes from the top to the bottom bowl of the hourglass and takes the place of the falling sand or crushed eggshell on an hourglass. And you can walk right up to that beam of light and it's protected by uh, an insulated cylindrical glass uh, so you don't burn your arm off, but it would. It's super heated, so you can touch that glass. You can viscerally feel how the technology works. And then under your feet, that beam of light is hitting the vat of molten salt, converting the balance of systems under there with a turbine and electricity flows out. And you are no longer disconnected culturally from the origin of your energy. In fact, it becomes an object of art in your urban landscape. So I'd highlight those two. And if you want me to talk about it, certainly. Well, it's, it's great. And, and they're both, um, those were great verbal visual descriptions of how, um, evocative and different these takes are on renewable energy that make you want to learn more about it in the way that when they're detached and abstract and kind of cold and hidden, um, you don't, uh, in the same way, it sounds more boring. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. So, um, one of the things this was, was funny. It was, it was a, an anecdote from one of the, the, the presentations I watched of you and Elizabeth giving to a, to a class, um, you had an example, one of the, one of the proposals was like, it was like a solar duck, right? It was basically like a giant duck that collected, um, solar energy. And, um, one of the students asked like, Hey, how do you, um, convince an investor or somebody like, you know, when it's sort of silly, like when it's a, a duck and Elizabeth, I'm paraphrasing, said something to the effect of like, the power of the duck has been proven. Yes. <laughs> Right. The duck's exciting. Like actually a big problem that some of the people doing this kind of work have is like generating enthusiasm and a, uh, an interest and kind of willingness of like, oh, that would be cool. And it spoke to this kind of point of like, 
there's a there's a business reason too to to stand out and 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 be more transparent in the mechanics and more approachable in the design is that well enough that was sort of what i took away from you know sort of the, the response to that and it, and it resonated with me because you know i'm imagining you know if you're a renewable energy project developer that the creativity um being applied here really can resonate you know traditionally there's always like a cost complexity kind of trade-off when you do something a little bit unusual but i'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to how you see um you know larger scale renewable energy developers being inspired by some of these designs either running with them doing something interesting with the materials um that are not you know, there's nothing wrong with one off site specific projects at all i don't mean to say this but like if you see somebody who is you know, building at scale, because that's their job and their business, start to pick up some of these influence and say, influences and say, oh, that's good. You know, that's, that's yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Energy Duck by Harith Pochi and Adam Kahn from the 2014 competition also um, is a great example. And so, you know, a lot of our work is also about STEAM education. And so we do a lot of uh, programming um, talks with young people and workshops and art and energy camps and, you know, approaching STEM disciplines through the arts has, is a proven way of capturing young people's imaginations and curiosity. So you show them energy duck on the screen, which is a huge five story doll, tall duck made out of solar panels. And they, one, uh, five, a uh, fifth grade, um, student one time just stopped us in the middle of the lecture and he said that is genius <laughs> and it's, it's so funny we just the whole the whole room cracked up but um but it is genius in a kind of way because um everybody loves a duck uh it teaches people about the duck curve for renewable energy which i'm not sure if you're familiar with but it's basically if you chart the production of solar energy against the demand of power it sort of looks like a duck it's got its um its body is the the big solar um production in midday and then its duck head is how it's the peak of demand is right after sunset when everyone's come home from their day and uh, fires up all their stuff at home um and so it teaches about that it's also a battery the duck is because it allows itself to think in a controlled way uh at sunset and so water rushes into the duck belly through micro turbines to add a boost of electricity to the grid right at the time when the city de demands it. And then at first morning's light, when demand is very much at its low, it uses that solar energy to pull itself back up. So it sort of helps smooth the duck curve. And um, if, if not knowing, is, is, the, is the duck realized right now or is it a, is it a plan, a proposal? I'm actually not sure on that. Forgive me for not. Not yet. No, it it's okay. remains a concept to this day. Um, we've gotten close to building the duck too. And this, this is uh, exactly, um, you know, what you're talking about because the land art generator straddles the divide between art and public space and energy landscapes. It's really not 100% firmly in either. So it requires a developer mindset that thinks very holistically. Um, right now, there's still a bit of a gap, a divide between um, energy developer models and community development models. They're not the same people doing that work. Mm -hmm. We have decades of, um, of practice in, the, in architecture, landscape architecture, and urban planning, um, you know, since the the disasters of the urban renewal projects of the middle of the 20th century um, and the lessons that we learned by reading Jane Jacobs, um, et cetera, and thinking through how do you plan communities in ways that can um, enhance economic development and lift people up and, and avoid pitfalls of that that occur when you steamroll communities without their engagement, which happens, unfortunately, uh, the Robert Moser, Moses style of development. We don't do that anymore. We hopefully shouldn't do that anymore when we build roads um, and, um, and build public parks and other places in the collective commons 
we engage communities. We do charrettes. We do co-design workshops. We take surveys. We, at every step of the design process, we have um, presentations and get feedback. Um, when it's good, it works. When it's um, inauthentic, it doesn't work. But we know how to do that. And so landscape architects and architects have that toolkit ready to go. Energy developers, for the most part, haven't had to make use of that toolkit yet uh, because they've been happily um, building along with their um, perfectly arrayed modules on green fields um, and without much community engagement. But that paradigm is coming to a rapid end. We're running out of easy to develop green fields. We're seeing a lot more pushback from communities, especially when we're starting to compete with agricultural uses. Um, unfortunately, there's a dark underbelly to all of this with um, special interests funding um, astroturf, big grassroots things, which end up with moratoriums in, in counties where um, you can no longer permit solar um, until they figure this out. Um, but um, but that's but those fake concerns don't belie real concerns. There there is an important aspect to engaging communities nearby where renewable energy installations are proposed to be installed. And we would recommend doing that at the very earliest pre-designed stage so that you understand what the community you're, you're coming into wants, needs, and that you as a part of your project uh, help to meet those needs and lift the community up. And it's not hard to do. Um, we're not proposing that every new solar or wind energy development be a work of art. That's obviously, it would be great if the whole world were powered by our works, but that's not practical. The Land Art Generator Initiative projects are not the cheapest kilowatt hour. We're not trying to be. Mm -hmm. um, what they are, are um, examples of how we can um, creatively merge renewable energy landscapes into places where they couldn't go with a utilitarian approach and where there, there would be dramatic pushback from communities if we propose to paper over certain places, terrace places with solar panels. And so um, engaging communities up front in the ideation of these projects and co-designing with them throughout the process is a way to, to get those modules up, connected, putting energy into the grid cleanly. At the same time, um, we're handling so many other of the needs of these communities, providing shaded spaces um, and um, beautifying um, with solar mural installations, for example. You asked um, about which of these projects have been realized. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't really a concern for us at the beginning in 2008 when we started. We've always had the idea that before change can occur, it must be imagined and before um, technology can be deployed at scale, it must be firmly embraced by the public imagination. So we feel that there's a lot of value in, in thinking on a conceptual way through what is possible. So even these design competitions have been held as ideas competitions. We provide a cash prize to the winning, winning team. Um, and there's an exhibition and a book, like you mentioned, for every one of our competitions. So there's a lot of incentive. And these works live in the world, but on the pages of these books and on, on, in these exhibitions. Um, we are, since, since the founding, um, over the, we, we called the, um, the 2010s our decade of imagination, and then the 2020s is our decade of deployment. Okay. And, and so we're, we're really entering into that. Um, around 2017, we started a program called the Solar Mural Artwork Program. And there are a number of companies that have um, proprietary film that they can place onto the face glass of a solar module or set just behind the face glass of the solar module. And you can print anything on that, or you can make the, the solar modules a solid color um, and you kind of hide the bus bars behind. You can't tell it's a solar panel unless you really look closely or you already know it is. This offers the opportunity for communities to co-design artworks, narratives, something like you might paint on the side of a building, a mural project in the conventional sense. You can now 
digitally transfer that artwork onto a solar module and install that on the side of the building instead. And then it will generate electricity for a generation um, as it still accomplishes the, the, the benefit that you get from the beautification of our, of our neighborhoods through murals. Um, and so we've installed a number of those. San Antonio is, is proud to be the solar mural installation capital of the world right now. They've got the most. Um, we're installing one in Jackson Hole, Wyoming this year um, with a great partner there, Kendra Day. Um, Penelope Boyer is an artist in San Antonio who's been spearheading the projects there. So everywhere, we're very decentralized. We have wonderful creative supporters in cities around the world who contact us and say, how can I bring this here? So we, we think about the best model. Do we want to work together to, to build up for a competition? Do we want to rapidly implement a solar mural installation in a public space? And so we come to these um, ideas, or do we want to engage young people through an art and energy camp and have them design and install a solar sculpture for their neighborhood? Um, any of these outcomes are possible. And it's a way to really bring together um, art and technology and community. And the, the solar murals are, are really cool. I was looking at some of those on your site and I heard you talk about them. And um, now I'm not an expert in the, you know, actual energy delivery and efficiencies, but I think I heard you guys talk. It's really only like a loss of like a few percent of efficiency or something yeah. in that nature for those murals. Yeah. Exactly. And um, one of the more utilitarian uses of the technology is to print the pattern of roof uh, shingles onto the solar panels. So folks are doing that for residential installs all over the place. And even in that context, the, the loss of efficiency is a good trade-off for those um, customers. So um, in terms of the, the trade-off, when you can create a, a fantastic work of, of art and storytelling in public space, it definitely makes it worth it, especially when you're thinking about a particular context in which a straight up solar module probably wouldn't fly aesthetically with the community. Um, again, not to say that they're inherently ugly and I've seen some really great early building integrated voltaic, photovoltaic installations, which use conventional modules to quite a good effect. But when you have the opportunity to, and it is so versatile, why not take advantage of that? And then you've got organic photovoltaics, which are, um, you know, flexible, they generate electricity consistently, even in cloudy conditions or non-optimum solar angles, and they're translucent. They're an amazing media for creative expression. One of the projects that we love by an architecture firm in South Korea called Hiram Architects and Planners is Beyond the Wave, also a 2014 entry. And we always like to say that it's a power plant where you can take your family for a picnic. Yes. It's got these beautiful pink flowing ribbons of solar energy, and that uses organic photovoltaic technology, which is roll to roll, and it comes off in these beautiful, colorful sheets. Um, so we are now in this decade of deployment doing many of those solar mural installations with communities. And we're also at the early stage of um, we're actually in schematic design right now for the installation of one of the more ambitious sculptural land artworks, which was uh, a submission to our 2019 Abu Dhabi design competition. And that's going to be installed in a major U.S. city. And we'll have that announcement hopefully in May. So I can't say any more right now, but stay tuned. That's great. Okay, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna just give a little praise and and uh, fanism on this stuff too because, um, you know, I, I I do feel some kinship as I mentioned of you know, Regrid having started as a a project in a specific place. Our specific place was Detroit, Michigan, was where we were looking around and seeing the need to map and provide land information, ownership, condition, public ownership, opportunity, problems to people in the city. Pretty broad cross section of people right? Mayor and city government, but block clubs, neighborhood groups and, and everybody else. And so I, I know like full well, what it, what it is to like start a project with a like kind of a squint, like you have a, a desire to put something in the world that you think can make an improvement and the, and the various stages of that, that, uh, journey that you go through. And I love this notion that you guys are now like hitting your decade of deployment, having that plan, because you know, it's not like we've been working on these things for centuries, right? But I will say 
it's kind of unique that you guys have been building this with energy, no pun intended, creative energy and passion for 15 plus years now, continuing to look out to the future. Um, and it sounds like I was going to ask you, like, you know, how you guys, you know, continue to keep things fresh and evolving on this front. But I think, you know, having a plan to transition into this deployment oriented phase probably answers some of that question, right? You built up an incredible library of collaborators, proposals, ideas, experiences. And I love that the, the next outlook is like, how do we get to deployment with this? So I think, I think it's beautiful. So I'm just going to pause to say, well done on the journey. And Thank I'll, you. And yeah. I'll, another, another really important pivot point for the land our generator our initiative was when we were um introduced around 2017 2018 with the folks at the burning man project organization who were developing a place called fly ranch in northern nevada which is not black rock city it's the playa over a, a small a range of mountains, the Calico range from Black Rock City, from the Black Rock Playa, um, the Hualapai Flat. And Burning Man Project um, had their 1997 event there when they didn't get a permit from the BLM to use the Black Rock City site. And so since 1997, um, a lot of the founders and the Burning Man diaspora have had a uh, interest in Fly Ranch, and they were able to purchase it in 2016, I believe. And so that led to us putting our 2020 design competition out for Fly Ranch. And that design brief was, um, every one of them is unique and site specific and partner specific, but this one was quite incredible because we had the entire um, creative energy of the Burning Man community behind this, and of which there is some there, yes. <laughs> and uh, and um, you know conversations with the uh, Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe and other um, indigenous groups around that area, uh, the Gerlach Improvement District, and folks who are um, interested in in how that small town is developing in its relationship to the cultural activities around Burning Man Project and uh, the neighbors, the ranchers around, and everybody contributed to the development of the design brief, which not asked not just for energy as part in the landscape, but expanded it to systems of human survival in an off-grid environment. Fly Ranch is 20 miles from the nearest um, connection for electrical transmission, 100% off-grid, there's no services at all. Um, and so it asked for solutions for energy, water, food, shelter, and the regeneration of waste streams. So those five major systems, teams could choose one or all five or any combination and incorporate those systems into a work of art in the landscape of Fly Ranch. And 10 projects were brought forward to provide stipends and seed funding. And so they're actually building those as we speak. Um, yeah. And so that's another part of the, the, the entering the deployment stage um, with the awesome help from the Burning Man community. Yeah, and which brings together again that community engagement process. And then I guess like, it sounds like prototyping, right? Before larger deployment. Um, can I ask you, just before I forget it, because I know I'm gonna forget it too. I'm gonna ask you, I wouldn't necessarily call this selfish question, but it's selfish just because it's a local curiosity. Um, so I mentioned where I live as a former copper mining world capital and mm -hmm. boy, did they really dig here? I mean, they dug to a surprising extent, which is now largely invisible because all the big old hoists are gone and everything else those have been taken down. But there are dozens, scores, hundreds of um, tunneling projects, some of which go down to literally a vertical mile here. Now they're all just covered over. Okay. Right. Like if there, there's a couple open for like very controlled tourism. And I, I will hear, um, you know, probably once a year, every other year, somebody from a university has an idea mm -hmm. to repurpose them with like geothermal or something of that nature, which I will babble if I try to talk about exactly. Or energy that. storage. Yeah. Or energy storage there, right? But you've got these large, um, you never pay to have them made, but they're 
they're wide, they're tall enough for people to stand into, and sometimes they go down, again, 5,000 feet, although at this point, I know they're also largely full of water to various degrees. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious, you know, first off, I guess if you guys are ever interested in, a, um, you know, site-specific energy proposals related to um, unused mines and tunnels, I have a location to propose for, for proposaling. But I'm curious if you, guys, yeah, if you guys have ever worked in that kind of space, because we got them up here and um, there's a desire to find ways to reuse them safely um, and, and, and for like a pragmatic purpose um, and not just, you know, drinking alcohol inside of when you tear a gate off, which is, you know, probably a number one activity. That's fun too. <laughs> cultural. That's cultural for sure. Uh, but, but I mentioned that, I don't know if you guys have ever done anything with the, it's, it's, uh, would not be capturing the sun in this case. It's sort of the opposite, it's, you know, going down. Yeah. This. A lot of the teams, even though it's not an explicit design requirement, often incorporate energy storage technologies in creative ways. And we're really into that. Of course, storage is a key component of the successful transition with intermittent renewable energy. We're really um, excited about the progress that's being made um, in that. Um, so we would love to have a design competition that the design brief was, was specifically oriented towards both the reclamation of these um, industrial mining landscapes um, to, to create, to make them regenerative energy landscapes for the future. Um, it is an important conversation we need to be having about the material consumption use of the renewable energy transition. Um, we've, we've come to the conclusion that there's not a, a challenge in terms of material bottlenecks, but it is going to require some creative um, understanding of, of where these materials are sourced. Uh, we can't just rely on remote places, especially where uh, human rights abuses are, can occur for the extraction of these materials. Copper is a big one, of course, um, but then um, you also have um, many other resources that are going to be going into even just steel and concrete, um, building out the renewable energy infrastructure of the 21st century. So we need to we need to think about how we're extracting, how we're engaging the communities that are impacted by that extraction, and how we're doing it all in the most circular way um, and, and mitigating the impacts on the environment. So, if we would be um, putting together a design brief for a competition for art in the landscape related to um, energy storage and material consumption and circularity and all of these things would be a really, really rich design brief that would result in some incredible ideas, we're sure. We've we've had the fortune of engaging through uh, an organization called Coalfield Development in West Virginia and the uh, studying the um, reclamation of an old mountaintop removal site. And the, the strip mines all around West Virginia are opportunity for solar energy landscapes and engaging community in in that collective future and providing a, a new sense of agency and a culture where uh, there has been an antagonism towards the energy transition because it hasn't been the benefits of it haven't been clearly communicated to those communities um, we're excited that form energy one of the leaders in longer duration energy storage is opening their first um, facility in West Virginia. We can see more of that. We need more solar manufacturing there, et cetera. So um, engaging mining communities in co-design projects is a really important thing that we're tapped into. And um, we we almost had a project in northern Sweden at an old copper mining site. So we've been thinking about this, and that was probably goes back five years. So we've been thinking about this for a long time. Um, we'd love to make something happen book market yeah i know those you know i know i know enough folks up here to be dangerous with that stuff in a good way if uh you know that's uh would be, would be fun um the so you got me thinking to, 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 my brain is hopping pragmatically and from like perspective of who it's useful for you to connect with what kinds of um so i would say like obviously like designers you want to connect with them because you've got these challenges yeah. proposals when it comes to interfacing with renewable energy companies developers like how do like what's let's say i'm a renewable energy 
company I'm looking to install, I'll just make something up like agricultural solar. And I look and I'm like, okay, here's land our generator. This is cool. Right? Like, could they use some resource for me? Like as far as sponsorships, could they help me through some kind of like consulting? Um, what does that kind of interface look like? And I, I asked because, you know, we service, you know, a lot of customers in the renewable energy space with land information. And, and, you know, it just strikes me that like, if you're not on their radar already, like there could be some really mutually cool things. Like how do you interface with, with businesses like that? Is there a, or are there, yeah. Well, um, the network of uh, creatives, um, that we have, that's an easier thing for us because Elizabeth and I are, um, artist architect. Um, that's the world we come from. Um, we've had less success to be honest with engaging, um, energy developers and, uh, utilities and folks who are in the energy space. Um, but every time we do have conversations, it's always super positive. Um, like when we're interfacing with a local utility for a project and interconnection and solar installers, solar installers love to do solar mural installations because it's a unique thing. And they can- It goes back it, to the duck, right? It goes back to the duck a little bit. It's like- this Yeah, is yeah, exactly. Like who wouldn't want to work on a creative project when your day is usually just modules on rooftops? And engineers love to participate in the, the, the competitions, the land art generative competitions. We get some of our most amazing work from folks who are in their day job um, doing line diagrams and they need that creativity and they, they, they've got it and they, they succeed. Um, and so we'd love that. Uh, we would love to engage with more energy developers. Um, you know, there's an opportunity to do something like a 1% for the arts for energy where you take a project and you just invest 1% of the capital into an artwork and you engage community in that process. I mean, what better way to uh, proactively avoid um, pushback from a community for a project than to, before anything has been designed on paper, um, engage that community in uh, some kind of creative endeavor using a similar technology that you're going to employ in your more utilitarian field um, but you use that as a, as a public face, a screen, um, an amenity for the community. Um, you listen in authentically to their needs and you give them what they need, a, a picnic spot, a, a, a pocket park, uh, some component that can be open to the public where you're not just barbed wire fencing off your solar installation and saying, you know, no trespassing, um, but rather open these energy landscapes up to be multiple use um, and think about ways that you can do that, that won't um, be too risky for you as a developer. And the solutions are out there. And uh, there are exemplary, exemplary uh, solar parks in Europe where people ride their bikes, bike paths through the solar modules and nobody really messes with them. And um, so, and you lift them slightly off the ground in certain areas. Uh, the solar strand at the University of Buffalo um, by Walter Hood is a really great example. You just, just from simple gestures of like lifting the modules slightly off the ground, allowing prairie grasses to flow underneath and creating places that are, that are attractive for people to, to, to use. Um, and, and it's just a, it's really low hanging fruit, simple thing. And we're always excited to consult on those kind of projects with developers. And we have done a little bit of that. We'd love to do more of that. That's great. And I, I ask because just, you know, again, pragmatically, like I'll definitely bring this conversation when we share it to the attention of some of those groups. And I, I hope that, you know, at a minimum, it heightens some awareness and at a, you know, some other level, like, you know, why not talk and see what's up? I, just, I have a feeling that there's just kind of, you know, connections waiting to happen. In, in terms of how this kind of design thinking and engagement runs through the business of renewables deployment. And I know um, I do want to ask you about like your thoughts on land use and policy and land required to do this kind of thing at scale. You, you had mentioned earlier, you know, one of the things that caught my eye with your work is you guys did a really interesting study of the amount of land and water required to do hundred percent renewable energy in, um, I don't know if it was every country in the world, but it was, you know, it was kind of a global. Outcome. Yeah. Um, can, can you tell us about that? And can you tell us, um, 
we can, we can segue that into just some thoughts on like land use and land use, you know, land use policy in, in general, but it's really cool that you guys also have that kind of analytical, spatial, geographic take on this. It's, it, it stood out to me as like, you know, you're talking, you don't always talk to the, the businesses as much because you're artists and designers, but that's its own kind of spatial thinking, which I was impressed and I, I, I appreciated seeing. So t- tell us about that a little bit. Yeah, this kind of uh, gets into where we we like to intersect with policymakers, and so um, the 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 graphic that you're referring to is called "Land and Ocean Areas to Support a 100% Renewable Zero Emission Regenerative Global Economy," and it breaks down um, various types of renewable energy generation from offshore, onshore wind, uh, rooftop uh, solar PV, uh, commercial solar tv and thermal um utility scale um of, of both of those um geothermal wave energy tidal energy and it looks at the energy landscape meaning you're combining the spaces for a solar for example the spaces between the modules not just the modules themselves and then it looks at the technology landscape where the the amount of land use for the the technology itself and it shows the relationship between those for various technologies. And then it aggregates them all to show that um, if we wanted the entire world to meet uh, net zero um, complete transition from carbon-based fuels to uh, an electric electricity-centered economy by 2050, we would need to deploy 1.4 million square kilometers of renewable energy landscapes and 488,000 square kilometers of renewable energy oceanscapes to, to meet that. And this, this makes an assumption on the amount of total energy, basically um, taking into account the fact that if we're electrifying everything, we're going to have to build a lot more electrical infrastructure than we currently have to run our economy. But also that electricity is a more efficient um, form of electricity or a form of energy. So if you look at the Sankey diagram that we have right now, a lot of the energy is lost to waste heat. And um, when you are using electric motors, there's very little loss. Um, so there's some efficiencies, efficiencies to be gained, but we also need to account for a world of um, more humans on the planet. We're, we're not about aestheticism or degrowth or pulling back from our thriving um, you know, future. So we need to make sure that we're accounting for the amount of energy that we need to lift up the bottom billion to create a a, a thriving global world where it's not about sacrifice, a post-carbon future is about abundance. And so we came up with a number of petawatt hours per year that we need to generate. And we put that out and we figured out how much the land area is. And the good news is, while it is a significant land use impact, if you compare it to the amount of... um, land impact that we've already made in our urban environments and the rooftop areas that we have, we can basically do it. Um, But if we're going to bring all of that energy into the hearts of our cities, it's going to take a lot of creativity. Um, Just in the United States alone, we have about a thousand gigawatt capacity if we were to install every rooftop that's viable with solar modules. Um, We're very far from that, obviously. Um, And um, if you would do the same over parking lots, we'd have another thousand gigawatts. So um, right now we have about 1200 gigawatts of electrical infrastructure. So you're talking about tripling it just by covering rooftops and parking lots with solar panels. Obviously it's not that simple. There's a lot of storage requirements, et cetera, but it is feasible. And by thinking through these land use requirements, um, we can really understand what the lift is going to be how we're going to need to engage communities and how we're going to need to come up with creative shared land use. Um, One of the things that we've just recently published is our Build Back Solar um, essay in the Rutledge Handbook for Energy Transitions. And so that is just out now and available at Rutledge. We're the last essay in that book. And we talk about um, basically all of these things. And we talk about how we can ease the burden on transmission by having an aggressive approach to urban energy deployment um, and how we can really meet a lot of, of our needs by doing that. So in a, in a world where solar power is 40% of total worldwide energy production, 
um, we would need about 80 billion commercial sized solar modules installed. So that's, a, you know, 10, 72 cell PV modules for every person on the planet. So it's a lot. Um, right now, as we're speaking, we've installed probably about one and a half billion modules globally. So we only have 78 and a half billion more to install. Um, and so it's a huge thing. It's a huge undertaking. Um, it, you can't minimize it. Um, but at the same time, if you just think about it on a per capita basis, um, if you could be responsible for where 10 PV modules go, and you just think about that, um, it kind of makes it seem um, more personal than um, something that we really could accomplish. And if, if your 10 PV modules are designed as a solar mural artwork, then um, you've done your part there and it can make our world more beautiful as it becomes more sustainable. The, uh, so obviously, you know, dealing in, in land data world the way we do, when I was, you know, looking at your map and your calculations on that, you know, my brain was trying to think, I was like, oh, how could you take something like this and start to um, map it to the pixelated reality of land parcels and mm -hmm. and suitabilities and things of that nature? That might be a fun thing to stay in touch on trying to connect on. Um, you know, you, you had ripped a little bit on like, suitability scores for these kinds of things. And I know just in, in the, I keep saying pragmatics is my word of the day, apparently, but there I am. So like in the pragmatics of like figuring out where this stuff goes, it's not just the land um, shape and sunlight. It's also how is it currently owned, right? There's this whole like, you know, is the ownership set up? Is it public? Who benefits? Who yeah. Benefits? Is, is it just Wall Street or are we going to share this? Um, yeah, and, but... well, and who's inclined to, to be interested in playing ball on this? Because this is one of these things too, where um, I know that there are uh, you know a fair number of people out there who happily make um, some amount of passive income because of um, they've given permission for renewables to be on their land in some way, wind, wind solar, what have you. And um, you know, it'd be interesting to see it. I know there are many programs, and we have some customers who do this too. It's like basically you approach somebody with a large parcel and it's like, Hey, would you be interested in us doing this? Here's the benefits, including the check. Right. So like, I don't know that those, that gets my brain going of like, cause I kind of feel like the way the world works, you know, just the reality of it is like people often make big changes when there's like an emergency that happens, it would be nice if it happened in advance, but then like when an emergency happens or, you know, use a different word for it, some some galvanizing event, catalyzing event takes place, they tend to reach for the nearest plan. And so it's like, we live in this weird world. I'm sure you're, you all are familiar with this, where it's like, I don't know if people are that interested in what we're doing. And then all of a sudden something happens and it's like, oh, thank God this is here. Makes it really tough for, to stay motivated to have these plans in place. So I guess, what am I getting at? Like, I feel like further fleshing out that analysis and becoming more, even more concrete with how it could match to, to real legal land parcels would be a very interesting exercise. So yeah, let's stay in touch and collaborate on that. It's something that we've been wanting to do. So no, that's you know, great. So Robert, I, I really appreciate it. This is an awesome conversation. I look forward to sharing it with our, our audience and we'll um, zip up because so much of this work is so visual too. Right. Yeah. Obviously. So we'll zip it up with, with links and images and, um, you know, it's, it's great to make another friendly connection in the network. Um, I didn't shout this out before, but go Pittsburgh. I love that you guys are, are based there too. It sounds like we have some mutual friends. Yeah. And, um, next time we're passing through the Upper Peninsula, we'll give you a shot. Oh, I'm sure it'll just randomly happen next weekend. Right. Yeah. But if you guys, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so great. Thanks, Robert. Please send Elizabeth our best and uh, we'll talk. Yeah, to right. you. This was cool. fun. Yeah, appreciate it. Okay. See ya. Bye. Bye.